Hello, I'm Tom Harper. And I'm Diana Thomas. Welcome to That Wilbur Smith Show. A podcast about the historical, geographical, natural and human background to the world of Wilbur Smith. Ozuga, Robin seized his hand and began to drag him impetuously up the snow. Come and see. You must come and see. The old elephant road crossed the saddle through a deep pass, guarded on each hand by grey buttresses of rough grey rock. And as they took the last few paces over the highest point, a new and beautiful world opened below and ahead of them. Suga gasped involuntarily, for he'd not anticipated anything like this. Low foothills fell away from beneath their feet, regular as the swells of the ocean, covered with stately trees whose trunks were as tall and grey as the oaks of Windsor Park, and then beyond the hills, the undulating, lightly forested grasslands, golden as fields of ripe wheat, spread to a tall blue horizon. There were streams of clear water meandering through the glades of pale grass, where herds of wild game drank or lazed upon the banks. There were buffalo everywhere Zuga looked, black bovine shapes standing shoulder to shoulder in dark masses under the umbrella branches of the acacia trees. Closer at hand, a troop of sable antelope, that loveliest of all antelope, jet black above, but with snowy bellies, their long symmetrical curve of horn, extended backwards almost to touch the haunches, followed the herd bull in long file to the water pausing unafraid to stare curiously at the interlopers, forming a frieze of stately, almost Grecian design. The endless stretch of land was dotted with hills like ruined natural castles of stone, seeming to have been built in past eons by giants and ogres from mammoth blocks of stone and tumbled down now in fantastic shapes, some with fairy turrets and spires, other again flat-topped, geometrically laid out, as though by a meticulous architect with a plumb line and theodolite. This lovely scene was lit by a peculiar pearly luminosity of the morning light, so that even the furthest hills, probably more than a hundred miles distant, were sharply silhouetted through the sweet, clear air. Oh, it's beautiful, Robin murmured, still holding Zuga's hand. The kingdom of Monomatapa, Zuga answered her, his own voice husky with emotion. No, Robin answered softly. There's no sign of man here. This is the new Eden. That was a reading from the middle of Wilbur's 1980 novel, uh, A Falcon Flies, which uh, we started looking at in the previous episode and will continue in this episode. Uh, as you may recall, Falcon Flies is set in 1860 and it deals with the expedition of the brother and sister Robin Ballantyne and her brother Zuga Ballantyne, searching for their father who's gone missing um, after following an expedition up the Zambezi uh, somewhere uh, in the uncharted heart of Africa. Along their journey, they first fell in with the charismatically villainous yet impossibly seductive slave captain Mungo St. John. Uh, and his uh, arch nemesis, the anti-slavery naval officer, um, Clinton Codrington. Uh, They passed by the Cape of Good Hope uh, to the mouth of the Zambezi, where they met the evil Portuguese slave trader uh, and uh, all-round villain, um, Camacho Pereira, uh, who they fought and escaped. And now with their companions, Juba, Uh, a young African girl whom Robin has sort of adopted, uh, and also uh, Jan Charut, the Hottentot uh, sergeant who acts as a sort of advisor and guide for Zuga. They have climbed this wall of mountains and they are looking out into the land they have come to find. The what will become known to future generations uh, as Rhodesia and then later, of course, Zimbabwe and Zambia. Uh, so we find them halfway through the book 
And uh, Diana, in the last episode, you described it as a roller coaster ride. And really, the first half of the book is winching them up that roller coaster, um, you know, cog by cog by cog. And they're now literally at the top looking down. And it's all going to get very exciting from here. It is. And, and the peculiarity of this roller coaster is that all the people in their different little carts go along different tracks. There are four major characters, Robin and Sugo Ballantyne, and then uh, Mungus and John and Codrington, are, are now, as we get to the top of the roller coaster, about to be split into four completely separate narrative threads. Um, the St. John and Codrington have already been both at sea at different points up and down the East African and um, Arabian and what, what we now call the Gulf States um, peninsulas and, and coasts, um, either in Mungo's case looking for slaves that he can buy and take to America, or in Codrington's case, um, attacking slavers wherever he can find them, making rather bogus deals with sort of small-time potentates he meets along the way, causing a massive diplomatic um, incident because the Sultan of Oman, I think, who yeah. controls them all, rules them all, is extremely cross about, um, about his, his um, underlings signing away the trade upon which his wealth largely depends. Um, and it's only the fact that various messengers who are sent to um, intercept Codrington miss him that enables him to carry on. But um, he's, he's at one and the same time making himself the scourge, the blue-eyed devil, as they call him, um, of East Africa and the Horn of Africa, but causing a massive diplomatic incident and getting himself into a huge amount of hot water. Yeah, yeah, and if, there's two things that are going to be really significant to the plot here. One is that we, the reader, know the clock is ticking because Codrington has vastly exceeded his authority, and we know that orders are winging their way to have him relieved of his command and recalled to Cape Town. At the same time, as he has received, he his story has actually outpaced uh, Robin. Yes, that's true. Uh, and Zuga's. So Clinton has received, as the final thing we see of him in this section of the novel, he receives a note from Robin along with an earring that she has sent him uh, as a sort of tr proof of, of the truth of who she says she is, basically saying, come immediately, you must send help. And so we've now jumped back in time to Robin's story to find out what on earth has happened to her, that she has yes. felt the need to, to summon Clinton well, Codrington to help her. That's true. And, and the first thing that's happened is that she and Zuga have parted ways because she wants to continue the search for their father and he wants to continue the search for land and profit and tusks and goodness knows what else that might advance his wealth and his fame and all the things he wants. Um, so they go their separate ways. And um, and they have very interesting and very separate um, encounters, really, with various aspects of African life and various types of African societies. Um, and, uh, and this is sort of cutting straight to the chase. Robin does discover her father, but when she does, she uses her, she needs to use her medical skills on, on, on their father, let's put it that way. And she's also, at the same time, in order to, in order to get to him, she has befriended um, carefully, gently, by sort of quietly um, gaining the trust of the local people who are the Shona tribe, the Mashona, who are one of what will become... Uh, one of one of the two great peoples of Rhodesia stroke Zimbabwe. Um, and they are an agrarian people, essentially, um, as opposed to the Indabelian or Matabele, who are the warrior cattle herding people. Um, and they've retreated to these sort of hilltop villages um, from which they, they repel invaders by throwing stones. 
and 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 Robin kind of gradually wins over their confidence. Well, indeed, yes. There's this great scene um, after um, she and Robin and Zuga have parted ways, where her camp is attacked by li- by a lion at night, yes. and yes. Robin comes out of her tent in her nightdress. Um, and she is actually the one who fights off the lion as yes. he's busy dragging away one of one of her her bearers. And anyone who uh, is immersed in Wilbur's world will know that the story Absolutely. of uh, the um, the explorer coming out of their tent in their nightwear and fighting off the lion attack that, that's the foundational myth almost of all the foundational it's, well, and, story. And, it's not just, and anyone who's in, immersed in this podcast, we talked about it, and yes, it's it's, 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 it's it's, it's the touchstone the first, of Wilbur's life, really, I think. It really is. I mean, it's that moment his father really does. And he, he shoots three lions and he shoots them. Yes. I mean, she she sort of, she doesn't quite shoot the lion by accident, but but she fires as she's, without, I mean, she doesn't, she doesn't hunt the lion. She goes no. out there and, 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 and the lion attacks her and she more or less kind of blindly shoots at him and, and kills him. And, of course, this act... She's had the bearers who's, who've been with her, who've been assigned to her by Zuga, because they're kind of split up both yeah. the people and the possessions they have with them. Um, and they've been rather suspicious about taking orders from a woman um, because it's not their style at all. But once she's shot the lion, that's just the one, this is the one kind of man thing she really does. I mean, it's not that she's an extremely tough and whatever, but the, the kind of specifically what is seen and described and perceived by the people around her to be a thing a, a male warrior does, i.e. kill a lion. This earns her the respect of the people around her so that they are therefore much more likely to follow her, um, which is essential because she leads them, she and and, um, and her um, Moshona friend, lead them on what appears to be a long wild goose chase in search for man who may very well have died long ago. Um, but that lion is her kind of currency she can trade upon, which enables her to, to have their, their support. Very much so, yeah. But as I said, I think um, from a, in Wilbur's point of view, we've talked before about how Robin's, this is clearly the, the, the heart of the story and the, mm. and the main character. And I think by giving her that role, yes, uh, yes. Wilbur's really anointing her as you know, she is on a par with you know the the greatest pe- hero of his life, which is obviously his father. That's um, a really a really interesting little psychological insight there. So we'll kind of you know, this has been a very successful session, Mister Smith. But we've really <laughs> <laughs> yes. And Robin hears the story of someone who sounds very much like her father, um, and sets off in search of him, aided by one of the an elderly. Um, member of the tribe who she's not entirely convinced is guiding her in the right direction so there's quite a long point at which is she going to get there or not um, and then meanwhile Zuga has been off um, well you take up Zuga's story because um, I'm so confused now I'm actually confused myself so Zuga has uh, he's gone hunting um He's shot an awful lot of elephants, um, which has made him very happy. And uh, he's found a lot of ruined towns and fields and uh, yes. sort of remains of some kind of civilization. But he's not yet found uh, this mythical kingdom of Monomatapa, uh, or, of course, the gold that he is so interested in. Yes. Um, so one of the things, Zuga finds their father's journals, which uh, in the best traditions of adventure fiction does indeed contain uh, a map and directions to a lost city, uh, yes. potentially fabulous wealth. So Zuga, again, um, chooses... Which actually path. exists, going back to our earlier theme. Yes, yes. This, this, this legendary mythical lost city, was, which is exactly where everybody said it was. Yes, I mean, and really exists, and not just in the book. Yeah. Um, but before he can go there, um, he has an encounter with this sorceress, uh, um, the Limo. Limo, 
and he goes into her cave and he hears these mysterious old voices and the cave is full of bones. And so you're thinking this is going to be some horrific person. And again, this is Wilbur brilliantly, in my view, subverting expectations because the bones, it turns out, are not those of human sacrifices. They're actually the bones of local peaceful people who fled to this cave That's right, yes. uh, and were actually massacred by, um, I think, the implications by the Matabili. Yes. Um, so they're actually victims of genocide rather than um, anything more exotic that our kind of white imagination might be supposing. And then the Umlimo is not this um, wizened old crone. In fact, she's this very sexy young woman, um, which again, I think is Wilbur just kind of playing with our expectation. That foul midnight hag his father had called the Umlimo, but this was no hag. She was young in full physical prime. And as she knelt facing him, Zuga realised that he'd seldom seen such a fine-looking woman, certainly not in India or Africa, and very seldom, if ever, in the northern lands. She had a long, regal neck, on which her head balanced like a black lily on its stem. Her features were Egyptian, with a straight, fine nose and huge, dark eyes above high-moulded cheekbones. Her teeth were small and perfect, her lips chiselled like the bits of a pink seashell. She was naked, her body slim, her limbs long and fine, her hands and feet narrow, and delicately shaped with tapered fingers and pale pink palms. Her small breasts, well, let's leave it at that, actually. <laughs> we're, getting to the point, we're getting to the point where it really becomes quite graphic. And, and actually, there's two things that are important about this, this, this sequence. Well, one is not important, but it's interesting. You might think that at this point, Zuga, like any good Wilbur hero, is going to ravish the Amnima and have his way with her, and she with him. Turns out not, but the key thing that happens in, in, um, at this point is that the Amnima gives him, gives, gives Zuga the prophecy which both gives the book its title and which sort of powers the whole Ballantine saga from here in narrative terms right through to the early 1980s and the creation of an independence in Zimbabwe. So the, 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 the prophecy goes as follows. The white eagle has stooped on the stone falcons and cast them to earth. She paused. Now the eagle should lift them up again, and they will fly afar. Zuga leaned forward, listening intently. There shall be no peace in the kingdom of the Mambos or the Monomatapa until they return. For the white eagle will war with the black bull until the stone falcons return to roost. Generation will war with generation. The eagle eaglet will strive against the bull calf, white against black and black against black until the falcons return, until the falcons return. And there are indeed the falcons of which she speaks. Over to you, Tom, to describe those falcons in the film. Uh, yes. Well, in fact, we should probably talk about where he finds the falcons, because uh, from the Umlimo, uh, Zuga carries on following his father's uh, map. Um, and... In, in fact, in a classic mythological style, um, you think of people like Siegfried, who follow birds towards the uh, the treasure lair. A honey bird uh, leads him to the ancient ruined city of Great Zimbabwe. The seeker of yes. sweetness. The seeker of sweetness, as the, yes, the, has the, the, honey, the honey guy. The, the little seeker. The little, yeah. um, and he leads him to Great Zimbabwe, which I think we're aiming to do a, a whole episode on, because it's fascinating. Probably... I think I'm right in saying the greatest megalithic construction in sub-Saharan Africa, um, an absolutely extraordinary archaeological site uh, with an awful lot of uh, mystery uh, surrounding it uh, that hopefully we'll, we'll unpick in a future episode. Um, from Zuga's point of view, what matters is that he finds a certain amount of gold there, um, and he also finds a series of sculptures, which I'm assuming are based on um, actual artefacts, uh, of stone falcons. And um, he de decides to pack up one of these, again, in the best imperial tradition, uh, following in the footsteps uh, 
of people like Lord Elgin. Um, he decides that uh, one of these Lord Falcons Elgin did, did Lord Elgin did pay for the marvelous print. I mean, that may not be that's kind of moot now, but anyway. Yeah, um, and I can't I can't remember who who it was who who nabbed and, the Bronzes. And, and, uh, and, Z- and Zuga Zuga is only he's um, he's enacting a prophecy. He's, he's he is if you look at it from Liam Nemo's point of view merely the the tool by which the the prophecy will the, be uh, revealed yeah exactly yeah um but he's also taking a bunch of stuff which doesn't belong to him so there is that yeah with it with a, with a view to culturally appropriate it um Indeed. so he uh, packs up one of these stone falcons and i do think this is um i don't think wilbur intended it comedically but it is almost like a running joke that through all the hardships uh, and impossible marches and starvation and diseases and everything else and capture by um, enemy tribes and all the rest of it they go through somehow they manage to keep this massive stone falcon crated up uh, and get it um, get it out surely that's not comic that's that's epic that's that's <laughs> that, that only goes to show that it's the fateful falcon whose whose mm-hmm. destiny is is to go with zuga and therefore it cannot be destroyed and there is a that's bit of a running joke between zuga and uh, jan Trout, where jan Trout is always true. trying to persuade him to leave it behind that um, is true. And, and Zuga absolutely won't. Uh, even when Zuga is maimed and suffering from malaria uh, yes. and b- basically uh, unable to move. Uh, but he still, and, and Jan Trude says, well, why don't we carry you and leave the Falcon? Yes, um, yes, yes. And, and Zuga says, no, I'll walk. Because <laughs> he's that kind of guy. Um, so they uh, finish plundering the ruins of Zimbabwe. We sort of leave Zuga now and we jump back to Robin. Uh, Robin is uh, taking Juba and her band, and in fact, Karanga, her um, local guide, and her group of uh, bearers and companions uh, out of this area. And they're going to try and hook up with something um, that's effectively the slave path um, that runs to the south. Yes, Um, towards the sea. Towards the sea. Uh, and they do indeed find uh, along this. along which Juba has gone, hasn't she? Yes, because she yes she was originally taken from this part of the world. Yes, she 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 is as it were a rescued a rescued yeah. slave. Yeah. Um, and again, I don't know how much you want to go into everything that happens there. Um, they run into oh, no, the Matabili. It's important. It's yeah. extremely they, important. They run into into the Matabili. Um, who uh, deserve uh, probably an episode at least all to themselves. Uh, one of the great warrior peoples of Africa. As does as does the conflict between the Shona and the Matabele, which which played out in real life mm. after the independence. I mean, when Mugabe took over as the leader of um, Zimbabwe. Yeah. Basically, the first thing, and he's a Shona. Kind of very, very, very early, and the and, and the and the kind of rival. Uh, and Cuomo, Joshua Cuomo was was the rival um, kind of leader of the independence movement, and he mm. was Matabele. And the first thing that happened was that Mugabe's forces went down into Matabele land, and you know, killed lots and lots and lots of people because it yeah. was like payback time. Yeah, because and, in fact, because, and you know what? It's only just literally the penny has dropped. Of course, nineteen eighty is the year of Zimbabwean independence, so this novel is published in the year. Oh my goodness! That after fifteen years. Fifteen years of um, effectively civil war, um, yeah. well, or um, certainly war of independence. Um, yeah, that because uh, in 1965, I think it is that Ian Smith uh, that there's the Unilateral Declaration of Independence for Rhodesia, and then 1980 is when it, it becomes Zimbabwe. Um, yes. So this is an incredibly contemporaneous for when it's published, uh, which presumably was in Wilbur's mind. Indeed. And, and again, that hadn't occurred to me. But I mean, and, and and if he was thinking, I mean, well, the prophecy that he gives to the Omnimo kind of tells you that he is planning to tell that story of the of the white eagle and the black yeah. eagle. That that's that's what these books are going to be about, and, and indeed it does. And they go right through to the to the to the um, to the civil war and its aftermath. I can say so on the road they encounter this uh, Matabili warrior called Gandang. Yes. Um, and Gandang, in a scene that I know you particularly like, <laughs> he comes he uh, comes across um, 
Robin and Juba uh, having a wash. It's not so much that I, I, it's not so much that I particularly like it. I just think it's a very my my. I was thinking about. This comes under the heading of "Could you write this today?" Um, but yes, so so that they've both found this stream, and um, they've been they've been on the on the road for a long time and are desperate to to clean up, and he. Gandang has quietly been following him, and he says, standing above the bank, half screened by the trailing creeper and mottled like a leopard by the slanting, dappled sunlight through the leaves of the forest, a tall figure leaned against the bowl of a white fig tree and watched the girl. He had stood there unseen and unmoving since he'd been led to the pool by the sound of splashing and singing. He'd watched the two women comparing their nakedness, the bloodless white against the luscious dark skin the skinny, angular frame against sweet and abundant flesh, the small pointed breasts tipped in the obscene pink of raw meat against the full and perfect rounds where their raised bosses, dark and shiny as new washed coal, the narrow hips of a boy against the proud wide basin which would cradle fine sons, the mean little buttocks against the fullness and glossiness that was unmistakably woman. Now, that of course is also the male, literally the male gaze, <laughs> but... In the in the kind of fair's fairness of of Wilbur writing, we we also learn that that Juba looks on Gandang with an a, a, an equally piercing female gaze and is equally pleased by what she sees. <laughs> um, meanwhile, Gandang knows that he should not be taking time off from his patrol and 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 the work he's doing for his king. Because he's had orders, and he knows that if you disobey the king, Mzilikazi, 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 yeah. Um, if you if you disobey King Mzilikazi, it does not end well for you, even if even if you are as a son to him. You don't do that. Nevertheless, when he sees Juba, a bit like Robin, when she sees Mungo, he just can't help himself. And and so he begins a sort of a, and he's actually quite a gentleman, because because they 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 meet and he's very seductive and she's only too happy to be seduced, and they kind of get down to business. Except that he does not actually make love to her because because that would be to dishonor her, much to her frustration and fury. Yeah. Yeah, because 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 she's very frustrated by the fact that he's rather sort of led her up to a moment of great excitement and not sealed the deal. But he does. He's a gentleman, and he proposes to her, and to and to uh, uh, Robin's absolute horror. Juba comes to her, and says that that she wants to marry. Um, and wants to marry Gandang, and and that there's no one else in the world that she'd ever desert Robin for, but this is her man, and she's got to have him, and that and that he wonders how much cattle Robin wants as the bride price, because she's as it were in the place of being Juba's mother or father, and and Robin is absolutely horrified that that that. Gandang is essentially suggesting he should pay for Juba. It's a bit like slavery. And Juba's mm. immensely kind of offended that, no, 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 you've got to take this, these cattle. You know, it's just nothing will work unless, you know, and don't ask for less than 100. You've got to have at least 100 head of cattle. Mm. And, and, when, and when Robin finally does ask for 100, uh, um, Gandang is immensely dismissive and says, no, no, she's worth far more than that. Should have asked for several hundred. Um, but there's a really that's a really interesting cultural little moment and the ways in which kind of her Western ideas of what constitutes uh, pr- not just proper behavior in the sense of, but sort of moral behavior. She's really troubled by the idea of taking anything in exchange for Juba. And Juba's really troubled by the idea that she's not, as it were, going to... F- Fetch a fair price, but, but as well, the, the rituals will not be properly observed. 
Mm. Um, and, and this actually had echoes in real life Africa. Um, but it's an interesting moment in the book, I think, where, where, where she wrestles with her conscience, but in the end gives in. Yes. Um, she, and it, uh, go on. Well, she has this very cunning, cunning way around it, which I suspect you were just about to, about to say, so go ahead. Well, she, she accepts the cows and then says, but you look after them um, and keep them for me. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll check on them at some point in the future. So I, a, uh, a, neat, a neat solution, I thought, uh, yes. in, which, in which everybody's morals are equally um, catered for. Anyway, so they uh, so Juba is um, happily wed. And this is actually quite a good thing for Juba because Robin um, continues down this uh, what they call the hyena road, which is so named because the hyenas scavenge off the, um, the, the enslaved people who sort of fall back, die on the road and, uh, and are left by the slavers. Um, and this is this is and this is where I just love what Wilbur does because um my book page 538 um we have the kind of happy farewell between Robin and Juba as, as Gandan takes her away you get about four paragraphs of them carrying on down the hyena road um you get them to the coastal plain so they're nearly there um you get a paragraph fever in the rigors of the last stage of the journey had tired and weakened them all they knew that they were, at the most, only a few days' march from the coast, deep into Portuguese territory, and therefore under the protection of a Christian king and a government of civilised men. Or maybe not. It was for these reasons that the hot and tot sentries slept beside the smouldering watchfire of Dampwood. And it was there that they died, their throats slipped with a blade sharp enough to cut off the least cry. In a sentence, or you've gone from, they're nearly there... Oh wait, they're dead, um, and it's that whip crack. No, no build up, no foreshadowing, yes, no yes, yes. tease. It's just in this. It literally in the space of a comma, it switches from uh, "we're nearly there" to "oh wait, we're actually in really deep trouble." Um, and that's the sort of thing that Wilbur does again and again and again throughout his novels. It's just where he you think that it's got to one place, he absolutely pulls the rug out from under you. Yes, absolutely. So the people, to, so the so people who slit the centuries' uh, throats in that passage I just read are the slavers, and they are headed up by our old friend Camacho Pereira and his brother Alphonse, um, and they take uh, Robin's companions uh, as slaves. They also take Robin as a slave because she um, is disgu- has disguised herself again as a boy, so that, um, they don't realise that uh, who she is. Uh, they take her to their barracoons on the coast, uh, where a slave auction is in progress. Uh, and Robin is put up on the block where Camacho Pereira recognizes her. But hold on a second. Yeah. In the spirit of the book, yeah. let us not reveal what is going to happen in the auction. Because parallel with this, things are happening. And we're beginning to get an inkling now. Um, in the first, in the first um, uh, episode, and we've mentioned it subsequently, um, um, Robin sends a letter, or, or Codrington receives a letter, rather, saying, help, help, come and rescue me. And then the timeline switches back. So by this point as a reader, you're beginning to think, oh, okay, beginning to see why she's in trouble. Yes, although I would say, actually, at this point as a reader, I've completely forgotten about the letter sent to Codrington because I've had probably oh, really? 300 pages of Robin and Zuga's adventures and I've largely forgotten about Codrington and Mungus and John and all of that. How could you forget about Quentin Codrington? I mean, really? Such a well, woman. I mean, he, 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 is a, uh, he is a model of Victorian manhood. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've, I've been swept up in, in elephant hunting and looking for lost cities. So. <laughs> Well, actually, well, the reason I say this is that Zuga, meanwhile, he has met up with Gandang. Yes. So he meets Gandang separately, and 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 then they are both at one time or another in jeopardy for their lives because Zuga's life hangs by a thread because Gandang doesn't know whether to kill him or not and has gone for orders from Zivikaki, his king, but also. Gandang's life hangs by a thread because he's been a naughty boy and he's been off 
um, I don't think I actually married, but that he's he's been off shacking up effectively, as it were, um, with with Ajuba. So both these guys are kind of waiting to hear what the king will say. So of course, naturally, what they go and do to bond as as two fine young examples of of black and white manhood, they go off and kill animals. <laughs> Catch. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Obvs. As, 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 as men have through the centuries. Indeed. And and eat, and they establish their, their credentials one with the other because Suga is amazed by the skill and bravery with which with which um, a Gandan can kill like a charging Cape Buffalo with his spear. And Gandang, who has seen firearms, but clearly not been given proper weapons training, hmm is immensely impressed since he's never been able to work, make a gun do anything other than go bang. Yeah. So not hit anything. He's equally impressed by the fact that 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 um that Zuger is confident enough in his marksmanship that he can stand in the face of a charging Cape Buffalo and shoot him with his gun. So they don't think they're tremendously good chaps. Um there's just this minor problem that that they may each that either um um Gandang may be forced, obliged. Zuga. Uh, Zuga, sorry. And, and I'm actually, I, 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 was, I was hesitating because I was thinking about Zuga's, Zuga's uniform. Because there's, there's, a, there's a little MacGuffin, a bit like a falcon. There's, some, there's one other thing which has been carried around all yes. through Africa and never abandoned. I'm going to come to him one second. So, yes, so, but, 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 but Gandang himself is concerned that when he gets back to see his king and delivers his report, she has to tell truthfully not least because the evidence is trotting along beside him, um, that he he will have his comeuppance. But the thing, the final way in which in which um, Zuga establishes his sort of splendor in the eyes of Gandang is that all this time there the other thing that has been carried around apart from that damn falcon is a tin chest which contains and of all that he's left behind by this point, his vital food, you know, all sorts of clothing, medicines, ammunition, whatever, but he has a tin um, trunk which contains within it something of extraordinary power, which is his ceremonial officer's dress uniform of yeah. bright scarlet, and gold and white, and when he emerges from the hut in which he's more or less being kept prisoner, arrayed in this splendour, Gandang is a, at once thinks, "My word, that's just amazing! I better take him to my king because my king's going to be equally amazed too." And sure enough, when he stands before Mzidi Kaki, Lord Kazi, oh. when he stands before Mzidi Kazi ruler of the Matabele, um, at the center of another great township, which we can come to in a second, sure enough, the, his uniform impresses the king just as much as it impresses Gandang. I, I, I sort of don't want to believe that that's true in the sense that it's a bit too stereotypical, but I suspect actually it might have seemed like, because we've already heard the wonderful descriptions of the, of the finery in which the Matabele warriors are arrayed, the ostrich plumes and the, and the, and the, and the, and the little sort of skirts of civet tails, and, and they are magnificent creatures, hmm. splendid men. And, and, and this is the way in which, in which um, Zuga achieves a kind of equality with them and, 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 and kind of impresses his way into the heart of Matabele society. Yeah. Uh, and with that access, he is able to negotiate uh, a treaty. As a reader, you sort of think this is probably going to come back uh, because he signs a treaty with Mzilikazi that gives him the rights to mine and hunt um, in this land that they've discovered, what, what will become Zimbabwe. Um, and uh, thus armed with his treaty, uh, he, um, he departs. The other thing that's, that's notable is that Gandang takes 
um, it's um, we see the tr all all the kind of the the, um, the Matabele are arranged into separate kind of armies, each of which has its own township, and they are all converging for sort of harvest festival, effectively in, in European terms, to the capital of the Matabele, Tabas and Dunas, which is described as really a very impressive settlement of sort of concentric rings and circles, immaculately clean, tremendous hygiene, you know, in other words, absolutely not a place of savagery, or these yeah. tough things happen there. But I mean, it, it is a civilized place within its own frame of reference. It's not something random. It's it's and this is where the king keeps his cattle and where the armies all gather together to parade before him. And so I, I just think it's an important thing because that's the point. I was very struck by the fact that he shows you that the white people are not, as it were, as, as, as even Robin thinks, coming to rescue morally and, and culturally and intellectually rescue these poor savages who just don't know anything about anything. But in fact, you have very highly organized, competent, civilized societies. Yeah, and there's loads of great details, aren't there? So this is a, a, a town or really a city of um, probably tens of thousands of people. And uh, but without yeah. anything that we would recognize as kind of sanitation or anything like that. But they have their own solutions to the challenges. So um, they all use one area of land as the latrine uh, and then scavenging animals will go and they'll actually break down. Um, the excrement, um, yes. so you don't get um, those sorts of sanitation diseases. Which, by the way, in, in kind of modern ecological um, uh, terms, is tremendously if, effective. I mean, there, there, there's no... There, I mean, this is the age, of course, of great sewers, Basiljet mm. building great sewers in London and stuff. But, I mean, there's no, there's no construction, there's no destruction of nature. On the contrary, you're contributing to nature. You're just making this part of, quote, Elton and, and Tim Rice, the circle of life. So, in fact, it's yeah. tremendously sustainable and <laughs> CO2 neutral. Yeah, um, yeah. But it is. I mean, it's, it's that they, fa they found a solution which is entirely natural. The, the other detail I loved is that they keep all their cattle in the, the pen in the centre of the city. Um, and the cattle defecate there all the flies then go on to the cow pats and lay their eggs there but then because the cows are penned up they just trample all over them and, and kind of crush the fl flies eggs so again you don't get massive swarms of, of, of insects yes. around your city so everything as you say works in a very naturally harmonious way whereas we would in, in a western sensibility would be looking for sort of technological solutions for all these problems yes they, they have very natural solutions exactly exactly which actually may turn out to be the better solutions mm. for the future of the planet and all that stuff. Now, Zuga has signed um, his, his minimal rights deal. Yeah. Now, we've kept, we've had the, you know, I yeah. hope, suspense has been building up in people's minds. What is going to happen to Robin? She's on the slaver's block. She's up for auction. She is, by the way, being sold as a boy because she has been, all this time she's been marching around um, Africa very sensibly, She's been wearing trousers and a shirt rather than some great big long skirt, which you know, makes perfect sense. Mm. But it means that she is being sold as this pretty young boy to be taken away and used. And then the shirt is ripped from her and it is revealed that she's not a boy at all. And then the bidding hots up and over to you. Well, the bidding hots up because Camacho Pereira, who has lusted after her, um, since uh, page um, 100, 200, um, 250, uh, is there, and he now has his chance to uh, take her and have his uh, horrible way with her. So he has put the winning bid on her. And just as you're thinking, how on earth is she going to get out of this one? An American accented voice comes out of the darkness uh, and bids 20 US dollars for her. And oh my gosh, 
I know. I, to be honest with you, I had not seen it coming. I didn't see it coming at all. And then when it came, you just thought, oh, yes, that's great. That's just, I mean, yeah. in the right, in the sort of right, run right his head, you go, oh, yeah, nice. Good trick. Like that. <laughs> it's it's one of these things which is inevitable and completely unforeseen yes. simultaneously. And that's the things as a reader just delight you. And of course, it plunges Robin. Because because the bid is successful. So she's now in debt in the most appalling way to this man. And um, he's still really gorgeous. <laughs> so, he's still... It's like hearing friends of mine describing their favourite tennis players at Wimbledon. Um, <laughs> he's still thoroughly yummy. And, yes. you know, and she still feels no matter what, she just can't help herself. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, and... Um... I mean, I do feel Wilbur as the author is basically Mungo is a knife that he likes to sort of stick into Robin and then just yes. twist and twist and twist and twist. So she's already in his debt because he has saved her from a life of slavery. But then plague strikes the slaves in the barracoons. Yeah. And Robin, as the doctor, is the only one who can save them. But of course, if she doesn't save them, they'll die. If she does save them, then they'll be they'll live um, and be healthy enough to be loaded onto a slave ship and carted off into slavery. So yep. it's an absolute devil's alternative for her. But meanwhile, of course, and then there's another a talk about twisting the knife. Yeah. So she and Mungo get back to doing what comes naturally to them. Yeah. And she, poor thing, at this point, has to admit that she's just desperately in love with him and always has been. And he he saved her. There's the minor matter of the slaves, which is not a yeah. minor matter at all, obviously. But, but she she thinks he's now seen the light and is going to give up his yes. evil ways. And then he reveals, just when you think he might be redeemed and that she might just have some fun. Yes, the, love, the, 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 the love of a good woman is going to save him. Yes, and that she might have the love of a good man who's good, you know, somehow who's actually good after that. When she finally kind of makes it plain how she feels, he's like, she must be joking. I'm already married with children. He did, I think earlier he's told her, her he's divorced, I think, or not married. Or she has, she has had some indication that he's single in the past, at the beginning, right at the very beginning of the book. But in any event, now he cruelly says, no, 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 I'm just being, having my way with you because it kind of amuses me. But actually, no, I've got this beautiful wife and these wonderful children, and I'm going to take these slaves back to our fabulous plantation. You know, tough luck. And just as they're about to set sail with the slaves aboard, she finds a way of writing a letter yeah. and getting it aboard by, by, by virtue of going to treat the crew of a, of a dal, of a, 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 you know, an Arab merchant vessel. She goes and passes on her letter to the captain of the of the of the of the vessel or whose crew she's treated and he and tells him to give it to the british consul in zanzibar and it's the letter to codrington yeah yeah so so now we get into an absolutely classic thriller really or yeah. adventure ending you have two ships one is the black joke which is this steam powered vessel which has the advantage that it can keep moving as long as it has coal when there is no wind, which the Huron, which Mungus and John's boat, is Mungus and John's vessel. Obviously, it's a sailing ship, so it's becalmed when there's no when there's no wind. But when there is wind, it's this wonderful, gorgeous clipper with just topsail upon topsail upon get flying gallant upon whatever. <laughs> yeah. So there's now a race basically. They, if the Huron gets past the Cape of Good Hope and onto the seas towards, onto the trade winds towards America. Uh, Codrington can't catch it. He has to get to the Cape ahead of the Huron. So that it then plays out. You're kind of following, you sort of see the, the, the two things from, from um, Robin's eyes and from Codrington's eyes. And, and, and it's just, a, it's an absolutely classic. It could be a, it's like a car chase, as it were, but it's not. It's a, it's a race against, it's a classic race against time. Yeah. The one character at this point who has not, as it were, joined up is Zuga, because he's off with the, the Matabele and he's off getting his gold right. And he's actually coming back overland. He's not coming back by sea. He is. With his falcon. With his falcon, yeah. <laughs> Zuga's going south overland. Robin's in the slave ship 
also heading south, praying, praying and praying that Codrington will catch up with her. Codrington is going as fast as he can, but he's going so fast that he hasn't stopped to pick up coal. Yeah. So this is a quite important point, is that he's in a coal-powered vessel. If you don't have coal, you pretty much stop. You've got some sails, but they're certainly compared to the hero, they're not going to get you anywhere. And he can't put into land because he has a feeling it won't end up well for him. And indeed, he's right. So good things don't entirely happen to Captain Codrington, but they sort of do at the very, very end. Let us, let's, let's, I think we can safely describe the resolution of Zuga and um, Robin's relationship. Do you think we can do that yeah. without, without um, spoiling too much? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's not really a resolution, is it? It's kind of a um, a break where they, they try and resolve their differences and almost immediately they're sort of bickering again. Yes. Um, because they, um, and actually I think this is Wilbur, one of his sort of more underrated skills actually is in that scene between um, Zuga and Robin. It's just beautiful, beautifully written kind of character Yes, dialogue where they can't help but push each other's buttons, even when they they sort of come into this conversation with good intentions of trying to make up, um, and in in the way that's really really true to life. Yes, I mentioned at one point that 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 Robin is kind of getting to the point where she she's starting to get one over on 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 Zuger, and the one thing she gets absolutely over on him yeah. is he's tremendously pleased because he, he's got he's got all this stuff he's going to be able to put in his manuscript and he's, he's going to you know so t- tough luck sis i'm going to have my best-selling book and yabu sucks only to discover that she's already put her manuscript onto a ship for england yeah a month earlier and she's going to beat him to the presses so so she gets her she gets her come up in or she well, she gives him his come up in that respect and i think in the end each of them kind of follows their own natural paths really yeah. their own natural instincts that 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 he's going to have he's got he's got gold and and tusks and falcon statues with which the book ends yeah. very very and she and she i think because of is now enabled because of her book to go off and, and fund her missionary work. Yeah. In which she will, with the very best of intentions, interfere with the cultures of native peoples so that they can benefit from God and medicine and things. And she means well, as yeah. well I can say. And then the very last scene of the book we, we just need to talk about, uh, it's just um, just a few paragraphs, uh, where is, is a it's not an echo because it comes first, but it's um, a, a very much like that fa- that famous closing scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark where you see the warehouse full of government secrets and the Ark of the Covenants being kind of shunted off into this vast warehouse. And here we're in uh, another warehouse in on, on the edges of Cape Town um, and a sense that it is piled with boxes of stuff that's been left. And in one of those boxes is the stone falcon. And and Wilbur leaves us with a reminder uh, of the prophecy um, that until that falcon is returned, um, there will be no peace uh, in the lands of the Mat- Matabili and the Mashona. Um, and it's yeah, it's it's funny. It's a very quiet ending for what has been an exceptionally noisy, busy, action-packed book, and sets us up for the further adventures of the Ballantines. Um, but there ends really, I think one of the right up there among the super duperest of all Wilbur's books. I think. I mean, everyone will have their favourite Wilbur book. Uh, Wilbur himself had his, his own favourites. I think if I had to pick one Wilbur novel to give to the British Museum or whoever, <laughs> the Museum of Mankind, as <laughs> this is this is what Wilbur Smith is all about. I think this this would be the one because it's just got everything at the absolute highest level of his craft. Yes. This is absolutely Wilbur at the peak of his powers. And in when he's at the peak of his powers, there's really no one better at what he does. So there we leave the Ballantines for the moment. Their story obviously continues uh, in the subsequent books in the series. 
we will actually be digging further into some of the, the world of falcon flies in some future episodes. We're going to be looking at the Zambezi River. Uh, we're going to be looking at the Great Zimbabwe and the civilization that produced it. Uh, but until then, that is all we've got time for. So it's goodbye from me, Diane Thomas. And goodbye from me, Tom Harper. That Wilbur Smith Show is produced by Christopher Wynne. Music by Dewey DeLay. Executive producer, Niso Smith.